This is our second uh, campus presentation to share the results from the campus climate survey that was issued to students in the spring. And so our first one was about a month ago. We had about 70 or so individuals in attendance. Um, Dr. Perman was able to be there and provide some opening and closing remarks, um, as well as other university administrators. But we wanted to hold some additional sessions to make sure that students had um, multiple opportunities to attend if interested. So we've got the one today at noon, another one at one, and then we're going to present at the USGA meeting, um, the student government meeting in April. And so I want to give special t thanks to Dr. Lilly. He was very um, invaluable in, in terms of analyzing some of the data and, well, analyzing a lot of the data, and also um, involved in these campus presentations, but he couldn't be here today. So Dr. Perman could not be here today, unfortunately, but he wanted to video a message um, for you all. So we're going to play that. Hi, everyone. First, I want to thank you for coming out for this presentation. It's important that you're here, and I'm sorry I couldn't join you in person. In a couple of minutes, you'll hear the results of a campus climate survey we administered last February. We wanted to know the degree to which you feel valued, included, respected here at UMB. We wanted to know whether you feel like your voices are heard, whether your problems are addressed, whether you're comfortable with, even proud of, the culture we've established here. I want you to know that we're committed to student success and inclusive excellence. We're committed to better understanding the student experience, especially as it relates to diversity and inclusion, so that we can improve it. And finally, we're committed to sustaining dialogue and action around the issues brought up in the survey which includes your work here today. Our goal is to ensure that every member of our community feels included and respected and able to succeed at this university and within your individual schools. So I urge you to get involved in the work we have before us. I urge you to lend your voice, your perspective, and your expertise to this effort. We need you and UMB will be a better university for your participation. Thank you. All right. So Dr. Perman truly is student-centered. I don't think I could find the words to tell you how impressed I've been about um, how much of an advocate he is um, for students. Um, I could give you several examples, um, but um, due to time, I, I won't go into that. But know that he is um, staying very, um, very involved in um, throughout this process. You know, we presented the results to him as well as the VPs um, in the fall um, and again has been staying very um, involved in this process and will continue to be. We wanted to start by talking about this concept of inclusive excellence. And so the Association of American Colleges and Universities have said that we cannot talk about institutional excellence unless we're also talking about diversity. And diversity truly means the ac making sure that um, all students can be successful academically as well as equipping um, all students to succeed in a diverse society. So giving them those intercultural skills that they need to be successful in society. And so we can't talk about institutional excellence unless we're also talking about diversity. Also wanted to share this framework, this Campus Climate for Diversity framework that has informed and will continue to inform our work moving forward. This framework was initially developed by researchers to better understand the campus climate for race and ethnicity, for different racial ethnic groups on college campuses. But it, it has since um, been expanded to be has been expanded and used um, in a lot of different environments based on a lot of different identity groups, including women, um, individuals that identify as LGBTQ, um, international students, and again, the campus climate for diversity more broadly. And so the framework states that there are some external factors and some internal factors that impact the climate for diversity. So those external factors include governmental and political forces, as well as social historical forces. So any examples out there of social, historical, well, let me start with the governmental or political forces that may impact the climate on a college campus. Anything come to mind? Well, 
the funding of higher education will impact who, who, could, who can enroll and who can't enroll um, in many institutions. When you think about some of the executive orders that were passed recently, um, immigration-related executive orders, um, any sort of decisions made around DACA and undocumented students, that could impact the climate for diversity on campus. When you think about some of the Title IX-related decisions that have been made um, by this and, and other, um, um, uh, I'm, I'm, the word is escaping me, but Administration. administrations, that's, that's the word. Um, it's going to impact the climate for diversity. So those are just some examples. So what are some social historical forces? Some examples here in Maryland or within the United States that could impact the climate for diversity on campus? I don't know if I'm answering the question correctly, but I'm asking, are you referring to things like integration? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. She said integration. Absolutely. Yep. The Freddie Gray, the Freddie Gray incident. So there are a variety of examples that we could point to right here in Baltimore, within Maryland, and across the United States that can impact the climate on our campus. Um, who's here, who's not here, at a minimum. And then within the institutional context, it's our historical legacy of inclusion and exclusion. And so both are true. We probably have aspects of who we are as an institution that communicates this valuing of inclusion. When you look at our mission and our values and, and um, different programs and initiatives that we have, that communicates um, a legacy of inclusion. But there's also probably examples that communicate, uh, and perhaps not intentionally, that communicate um, a, leg a legacy of exclusion. And so we need to keep that in mind as well. Um, the next factor is the compositional diversity. So who's here and who's not here? But it also goes beyond just the numbers. Um, we have an ability to impact the student experience, the individual's, individual's experiences on this campus by introducing diversity in um, different sorts of, of content, whether it's through readings that you have in the classroom, speakers that we invite to speak on campus, um, videos, there's other ways in which we can um, impact that compositional diversity. Um, again, we're always striving, um, we're always striving to um, have more diverse student populations, faculty and staff populations on this campus, but independent of that, there are some things we can do um, until we get there. Um, organizational and structural dimension, there's some examples there, but um, really when you think about those, um, those offices or those um, funding models that we have that really help to communicate that there's this value of, valuing of diversity. Um, two examples are we have an Office of International Services. We also um, recently, Dr. Perman charged the creation of a multicultural center task force. And so that task force met for a little over a semester and we issued some recommendations to Dr. Perman. Um, the behavioral dimension. So do, to what degree do we provide opportunities for individuals to engage across difference? Inside the classroom, outside of the classroom. Um, again, with diverse people and content. And then uh, the last dimension is the psychological dimension. That can be a little harder to explain, um, but sometimes it's the feeling. It's a feeling of whether or not you feel included or not. It could be experiences of bias that you might encounter. Um, it could be um, an article that's written um, in, a, in, a, in a paper in the community, and um, you may not feel as if it's um, it's been as if you're included. Um, I have a great example at, at a former institution where our um, the numbers of international students had increased, and somebody had written an article saying, "This isn't the campus I remembered." That didn't make our international students feel very welcome. Mm -hmm. So, any questions about this framework? I have found this very, very helpful to, one, understand the climate, but also um, in terms of impacting the climate. Because once we understand it, we can try to impact it um, and create changes. OK, folks. So um, we don't have that much time, and we want to make sure that we hear from you. So um, over the next several slides, I'm going to go through um, just some background on the tool that we used uh, to measure climate, student climate for diversity, and then we'll go over some of those results, and then we'll get into a meaning-making session. Um, before we get started, can I ask folks who are students, just to put your hands up, just to have an idea of how many students are in the room? Awesome. 
Thanks for coming today, folks. I think that uh, it's really important that you participate in this sort of conversation instead of having administrators only, you know, have those sort of conversations about what sort of climate is going to impact you. So I'm, I'm really happy to see so many of you here, and hopefully we will have a really good meaning-making session. So um, just so you understand the purpose of the climate survey, so we utilize EAB, which is the Education Advisory Board, uh, to issue this survey to understand and measure students' experience experiences, perceptions, and behaviors with respect to diversity and inclusion at UMB. Um, also to understand how different students are experiencing the same campus in very different ways or in similar ways. Uh, that's a really important part of that as well. Uh, we wanted to uh, support an evidence-based approach to improving diversity and inclusion on UMB's campus, and then also to collect information that's critical in creating an inclusive campus environment that allows UMB to tailor policies and programming based on the expressed needs of our students, improve campus responses to discrimination, again, based on those expressed needs, and then inform new programming and services that would be available. So the methods. Um, so with the EAB, um, they basically designed the survey tool that was utilized by working with institutions uh, across the country um, and having various levels of testing the survey to make sure that the questions that were asked were going to be the appropriate questions. So there was a lot of research and a lot of work that went into creating this tool um, long before we even signed on for the process. So um, it was administered a little bit over a year ago in fall 2018 uh, from, I'm sorry, February 2018 from February 7th to the 27th. The survey was distributed to slightly over 6,000 of our students. Uh, we had a response rate that was about 24%. One of the great reasons for using EAB was that it allowed us to participate as part of a cohort and to understand how other campuses um, students were experiencing these same sort of um, issues or experiences on campus. And so from the cohort, it was administered to 42 uh, other campuses across the U.S. and Canada. 57% of those institutions were public institutions. And so it was distributed to over 400 55,000 students, um, and so the response rate overall for all of the institutions was 17%. So you'll see that our response rate was slightly higher um, than the other, um, than the cohort as a whole. Okay, so in order to understand a lot of the data, we uh, constructed scales. And so we are only going to share like a segment of the information with you. It's really heavy. There's so much information to be found um, from the data that was collected. And so in order to make meaning of it, we created uh, these scales by doing a factor analysis. And so that was important to figure out how certain questions are working together to measure something. And then we were able to name those sort of um, those, those scales. And so the first one is university commitment to diversity. And so examples of questions that were included in that were, um, do you feel that there is diverse representation among the student body? Do you feel that there's diverse rec uh, representation among faculty? Do you feel that there's diverse representation among administrators? And so those sort of questions work together to measure this particular scale, and you'll see that there were eight of them total. Um, and briefly, towards the end, um, before we get into the meaning session, meaning making session, I'll go over some of those results with you. So, what we would like to do first is go over information that's contained in a infographic. So Angela Jackson, who's not in the room right now, she created this infographic, and it was amazing. Honestly, when we asked her to create the graphic, I didn't expect to see this and to see something that was so concise and makes so much sense. Uh, so Dr. Alvarez is passing those out to you now. We'll kind of work through some of the areas that are on the infographic. So if you do have that in front of you, you will see um, towards the bottom corner, there's a general campus climate. What we decided to do on this info, um, infographic is to select the areas that we felt like Campus Life Services could be the most impactful of. And so you'll notice that everything's not here, but just the, the areas that we felt that we could be impactful. So you will see that 64% of those who um, participated said that it is easy to find people on campus who understand them. 64% feel close to people at school, 
and 92% feel safe at school. And so in seeing this 92%, some folks may interpret that as, you know, we're doing great. And we are, we're doing well, but there's still 8% perhaps that are not feeling safe on campus. And just like it is really important for us to celebrate what we're doing well, it's also very important for us to understand what is happening that those experiences for that 8% are distinctly different. Right? And so those are some of the questions that we have to ask uh, to figure out why those experiences are indeed different. So now we're going to move on to diversity and inclusion experiences, which is above the area that we just talked about. And um, what's <coughs> highlighted on this screen um, are the ones that are on your sheet. And so just to give a quick one, 80% um, diversity is fully embraced within the campus culture. And still, again, acknowledging that 80% and then looking at that 20% and figuring out what's the difference there. All right. Conversations with diverse peers. And I think that this only tells part of the picture, part of the story. But if you look at the infographic, you'll see something that's a little bit different. And so you will see individuals who are having conversations uh, versus individuals who are socializing. All right. And so you'll see with political beliefs, 48% of respondents socialize with students who have different political beliefs than them but 34% engage in serious conversations with folks across political belief systems. And so you'll see that that is a trend throughout with all of the different groups that are highlighted here, there are more interactions versus serious conversations, right? And again, in the meaning making session uh, segment, maybe that's something that you can discuss at your tables. Experiences with discrimination and harassment. And so 17% of students stated that they've, they reported that someone shunned them, ignored them, intimidated them, acted directly or indirectly towards them in an offensive or hostile manner that interfered with their ability to learn and work once or more than once with, um, in that academic year. And so of that 17%, so taking that as a whole, um, the percentage of students who reported the incident was 12%, all right? So very small amount of students who are experiencing um, this sort of discrimination behavior are reporting it. So respondents who experienced discrimination or harassment most commonly reported that it was um, that they were deliberately ignored or excluded. Instructors made verbal comments that were hostile or offensive, and they were a target of offensive humor. And it seems like this deliberately ignored or excluded part is, ex is, is crucial. Um, a lot of times when we're talking to folks about discrimination, they're thinking about their actions they're not thinking about their inactions, right? And so the inactions, excluding someone, ignoring them, can be just as harmful, perhaps, as some of those actions. And so really starting to talk about the fact that if no one else is allowed at this table, what's that impact on the individuals who've been denied access to that table? And then respondents who experience discrimination or harassment commonly believe that the conduct was based on other, my race, or my gender and gender identity. And a lot of times other consisted of hierarchy, um, especially when we see the comment about, or the stat about instructors made verbal comments that were hostile or offensive. There's that power dynamic that's there, there's hierarchy. Also in the other was academic preparedness for the coursework and people's assumptions as to whether or not someone was prepared to participate in, in that course. Um, going back to your infographic on the back, there is something about bystander behaviors. And so since the beginning of the school year, have you observed someone on campus being shunned, ignored, or intimidated, or treated in an offensive or hostile manner? So 13.1% said yes. Um, and then to that point, 86.9% um, said no. And again, folks were reporting that the reason, I'm sorry, they were reporting that um, their reactions were, some folks responded that they told someone of authority. Um, some folks interacted with the individual who they believed was targeted. Um, some confronted the person who appeared to be causing the situation. 
Respondents asked others to defuse the situation. Some respondents did not take action, and some provided other responses. Um, the other responses, one of which was they may have connected students to students who had shared experiences, so that at least, at least there was that coalition of individuals who had these shared experiences who could then, um, I don't know, maybe um, comfort or strategize on how to proceed, but just connecting folks with individuals who may have had that shared experience. Okay, does anyone have any questions about what we talked about on the infographic? Okay, so quickly, we're going to go into um, the indices um, based off of specific uh, populations. And so, as I said earlier, these indices, we created these by using a factor analysis, by looking at questions that, in, uh, that uh, work together to answer something specifically. And you'll see that the areas that are underlined, that is where there is statistically significant differences between groups. And so just to highlight a couple, so with race, uh, black and biracial, multiracial or other, students felt that UMB was less committed to diversity compared to white and Asian students. Another one is black and Asian students report less interaction with students of diverse identities compared to white students. And this actually is on your infographic under the climate indices. Um, there are some highlights that are placed on there. Sorry for not mentioning that earlier. Um, moving on to first generation college students, again there were some, uh, some significant findings here. And so first generation college students view UMB's climate as less respectful to diverse identities compared to non first generation students. Moving on to students based on involvement or la lack of involvement, uh, there were some differences here. So. Uninvolved students reported less interaction with students of diverse identities compared to students who are involved. Citizenship status, um, non-citizens -citiz report greater efficacy in reporting discrimination compared to U.S. and permanent U.S. residents. Gender, um, there were some differences here that were significant, and so Students who identify as uh, women, women uh, report less interaction with students of diverse identities compared to students who identify as men. Sexual orientation, um, heterosexual students report greater efficacy in reporting discrimination compared to LGBTQ plus students. And um, you'll find that on the infographic, we have more um, instances for race and sexual orientation because those were the areas that had the most um, statistical significant findings as far as the various indices were concerned. Uh, so there's a reason why certain identities appear on that infographic more often than others. Does anyone have any questions about that, about the indices? No? Okay. So we went through a lot of information in a really short period of time. So it might be really difficult for you to, um, to come up with questions, but perhaps you also came prepared for questions. Is there any comparison? Is it? I can talk about it. Is there any comparison between our cohort data and the overall cohort? And are we in alignment with, with the cohort? Okay. What well, we, we, um, our campus is, is so very different than really all of the other institutions except for one in um, the cohort. And so we actually reached out to EAB to see if they could communicate with that other institution, if they would be willing to um, share their results so that we can make some comparisons. Um, and they weren't willing, unfortunately. Um, so that comparison data really proved to be not very helpful because our, our campus cultures, climate, institutional contexts were so different. That's a great question here. Anyone else? Oh. Um, I just wanted to know what institution that was. Uh, they didn't tell us um, because I sent a list of all of our peer institutions and they said that yes, there was one in the cohort, but they weren't willing to share. 
I'm just curious, uh, when I look at the reported actions to improve, is there, will, will, will there be any uniformity in, in approaching these actions, or, or will we sort of look to each of the schools to, to do their own thing? We appreciated that question in the survey because it allowed students to give us feedback on what sort of actions they thought would be helpful. We're going to continue to engage in action planning at each of these campus presentations. We also have a work group convened that has representation from each of the schools. Um, and so that's another avenue where um, we'll engage in some action planning. If, you're, if anyone here is interested in being a part of that work group, just let Courtney or I know. Um, our campus life services team are going to engage in action planning and then we're going to meet with each of those student affairs um, deans in each of the schools to engage in action planning. Were you able to stratify the analysis by school to see what schools are doing better uh, than others and then you could kind of adopt what programs they're using? So we were able to look at uh, school specific information and determine like this school versus all other schools and sh so we are able to share that information at the dean level um, and so um, and we did share that information so in order to share that more publicly we would need to have further conversation with deans about that. Because the deans were going to make the decision on how to um, approach that data. Um, I know that, I mean, I couldn't tell you how all seven decided to, to share the data, but I know that some have shared it at different levels. So I'm, I'm curious, um, looking at the bystander behaviors, I, some of these numbers are really striking. For example, one in 25 persons would actually try to help someone who is having a difficult time. One in a hundred persons would re confront the person who is causing a problem. So I guess my question is, um, what, what measures or what plans are there to essentially help to create a culture of inclusion yeah. and where people feel like they can help or should help? Mm -hmm. should, she said not doing something right. could be a problem. Right. And I find this kind of striking, especially in a campus like ours where we're trained to be healthcare providers, mm -hmm. teachers, um, uh, social workers, et cetera, legal protectors. Mm -hmm. So this, this, is, this is rather striking, these, these numbers. So what, what plans are there to actually address these kinds of numbers? Well, we plan on adopting some bystander intervention curriculum and training on campus. And so we're going to allow and hopefully, um, um, hopefully our work group will and other groups will help us figure out some good ways to approach that but it could be online it could be face to face um, I feel like I mean that was a no-brainer in terms of the need for that sort of um, training and development on campus um, what is it about um, UNB's campus that makes it so vastly different from the other schools that were involved in the study is it the size is it the we we'll make like the different schools that we have on our campus. Or... Yeah. No, yeah, it's. I mean, it's, a lot of it is they're primarily undergraduate serving institutions, varying size, um, varying. You know, some of the campuses. A lot of the campuses were primarily residential, so the students lived on campus versus off. So those were a couple of of examples. Okay, I'm sorry. You may have mentioned this in the beginning of the, it went to all the schools, the surveys went to all of the schools. Um, so what is our, collectively, this number of students in all the seven schools? Um, say if it was 15,000, so we got about 1,400 that responded. Mm -hmm. Am I in the ballpark in terms of the, So all, there are the a little, around 6,000 or so students on campus. So yeah, 1,400 that responded, so, so yeah, so it's, it's about the, around between six and 7,000 students. Um, it was actually sent to 6,115 students or something along those lines, and then the 24% responded. I, I don't know, I'm just learning to be yep, 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 yep. Um, So it just seems like, again, with the number that responded, was there a breakdown in terms of, again, race and things like that, who actually responded? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to? Oh, definitely. It's definitely. Those, those figures or 
I am not sure if we collected the information by race, if we did frequency analysis by race. We definitely did it by schools to determine what the shakeout was by school. And I we can't may recall. Have. I think we may have, and I think it was just so much information. We had to be selective around what we shared here, mm -hmm. but we can share that with that work group um, so that they can have a better sense of who was who, who responded to the survey. Yeah. So just, I'm just guessing, again, my research kind of not doing it, but learning about it first year. Um, it would seem like, again, you got the percentages, but again, if it's from maybe one group more so mm -hmm. than another group, and it seems like some groups are not really responding, so it could have been because, again, looking at the size, mm -hmm. they don't respond, given how many students at the school, mm -hmm. it could be. So your question is jogging my memory. We did definitely we did um, look at those frequencies, and then we also compared them to the overall populations at the institution. But somewhere in between, like presenting this multiple times, that slide was taken out. So, but we did do that, uh, and for the most part, things were pretty aligned. For the most part, school representation of who took the surveys was was pretty close. Uh, gender was pretty close, but keeping in mind that the only information that the school has is woman and man, right? So those are that's all that we're able to compare to, compare to. But in this survey, we did ask folks to identify um, their to give their gender identity. So when looking at the data by school, are we confident that when a student is ask, answering that question, they're looking at UMB or are they looking at their individual school? That's a great question. Yeah. And that's one of the limitations of this um, study and survey is we don't know. Um, the, in the next iteration, we plan on issuing some qualifying language to try to <clears throat> um, Clarify with students what that is. So, did we collect by age as well? Age of respondents was that a question? I think there was an age range. Yes. So, in the last 15 minutes or so, <clears throat> we would love if you all could help us with some of the meaning making, or continue to help us with some of the meaning making and action planning. And so, we have a handout that we would love for you at your tables to um, have some dialogue. We <clears throat> have some questions that um, reflect this campus climate framework. We also um, have the last question. Feel free to focus on whatever you feel like you have time to focus on because we don't have a lot of time. Um, but there are a couple of questions here. What external factors may have contributed to the results? What is our historical legacy of inclusion and exclusion? What organizational and structural factors help to promote or hinder a welcoming campus climate? And the last question asks you to um, identify aspects of the infographic and to provide us with some recommendations you have in terms of trying to impact and create change around that particular data point. <clears throat> Testing, one, two, three, testing.
Testing, one, two, three. I can't hear me over there, so that's good. So you couldn't hear yourself over there? No. But you could hear, I could hear you over here. That's good, because I took the microphone from over here. Oh, I thought you were using the microphone. No, no, no. Okay, well, I'm going to test here. I'm going to use it that one. That should be fine. So, microphone is
Okay, folks, if we can, if we can wrap up what's going on in your groups and focus your energy back towards the front of the room. You want to focus that energy back towards the front of the room. So, all right. So we'd like to hear what you discussed in your groups. We don't have very much time, but if there's anyone who would like to share like one of the highlights from your discussion at your table, uh, if you can raise your hand, I'll make sure the mic gets to you. Anyone? I heard some really good conversation. <laughs> Are you? I don't know. Okay. So, uh, what external factors have con contributed to the results? Is this uh, working? To push no? yeah. Oh, okay. Let's speak right into it. So the first thing we identified is that the tool may not have been effective in measuring diversity and inclusion in a siloed environment like our university, which is very much um, school-centric. School um, there was not enough knowledge about the respondents and their motivations. Um, and um, what is our historical legacy of inclusion and exclusion? discrepancy between the university's values in terms of what it communicates and then it's the actions that it, it ties to, to those values. Um, and historically, we are still very a male-dominated culture um, in terms of leadership and so on. Well, we want to be cognizant of time, but if you could please leave your notes on the table, we will use that information. Again, we're going to share it with our work group. If you, again, are interested in being a part of that work group or just want to have an additional conversation about the results, feel free to contact Courtney or I. Um, the PowerPoint is online. If you go to the Campus Life Services website or just search for Student Campus Climate, you will um, uh, find the PowerPoint as well as the infographic online and so you'll get a chance to see that last slide or two that talks about next steps um, which really is continuing to engage with the work group and other um, constituents on campus to do some action planning and then the last note um, before I pass it over to Courtney is we also um, one of the no-brainer results was um, we really need to work to communicate with the campus community how they can report an incident if they encounter any sort of bias on campus and so we've already begun to work with Mikhail Kushner um, from the Title IX office on pushing out information around again how do you report an incident if you encounter one. All right, folks, so after this, probably tomorrow, I'll send you a follow-up email, which will include links to the website so that you'll, you will be able to access the PowerPoint and the infographic. Also, I will share the web information if you're interested in joining one of the work groups, uh, so you don't have to search for that unless you're super anxious and interested in doing that today. Otherwise, you'll get that information tomorrow morning, uh, and so you'll know how to proceed so I think really just thank you to everyone who came out today. Thank you for participating and sharing um, your different experiences, sharing um, your feedback on how we can proceed. And so if you, are, if you were able to take notes and you're willing to share that information with us, if you can just leave that on the table, that would be perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you.